Aloha Trinity Ohana. Thanks for joining us for another one of our video devotions. Today we're going to be in Psalm 8, and there's a lot of different types of psalms. There are laments, there are psalms of thanksgiving, psalms expressing confidence in the Lord, and there are hymns. And as we look at Psalm 8 today, Psalm 8 is a hymn. And generally, hymns will do two things. They'll typically begin and end with an exhortation to praise the Lord. And then secondly, they will give us reasons for why we ought to praise the Lord. And so that's what we see here in Psalm 8. If we look at the structure, the first and last verse is actually the same. It reads, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's really the exhortation to praise the Lord. And then when we, that sort of, that verse kind of bookends the psalm, the first and last verse. And then we want to see what the middle contains, the body. And that's really where we get the reason uh, for why people ought to praise the Lord. And in the middle of, of the psalm, we, we see the psalmist describing mankind in relation to the wonder of God's creation. The other night I was at Pastor Matt's house and of course we were practicing proper social distancing and we were looking at, uh, we were outside and we were looking at the stars in the sky. We, we actually, the sun hadn't gone down yet and so the sky was still blue and we saw shining so brilliantly uh, the planet Venus and we were just struck by how amazing that, that scene was. Uh, we were filled with awe and wonder. And that this is the same awe and wonder that the psalmist expresses in, in Psalm 8 when he looks up at the heavens. And he says this in verse, verses 3 and 4 of our psalm. He says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? This is the question that the psalmist asks when he looks up at, at the heavens. He asks, what is man that, that God is mindful of him? There's, there's of course, this, this smallness that the psalmist is expressing. Smallness uh, compared to the majesty of God's creation. But look at what he says next. He gives an answer to the question and he says, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now the psalmist is reflecting on the uniqueness of mankind in the created order. He's actually reflecting on the first chapter of the book of Genesis. The first chapter of our Bible where God creates mankind. And what's very interesting when you read Genesis 1 is you have God's beginning to create uh, all, all of these living uh, organisms. Uh, he begins by creating all of the vegetation and the plants yielding seed. And God says, let them be created each according to their own kind. But it's interesting, when he gets to the creation of mankind, he doesn't say, let us make man each according to his own kind. He says, let us make man in our image, after our own likeness. And he says, he continues by saying, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You see, mankind is really the crown of creation, of the created order, made a little lower than the heavenly beings, as our psalm says, crowned with glory and honor, created after the image of God. It's a very positive view of mankind here. And it's very interesting, you'll notice this is really where the psalm ends. It, it really doesn't pick up on a different theme from here. It, it reflects on the glory uh, that God has bestowed on mankind. And it's interesting, there's no talk of sin. There's no reflection on the fallen nature uh, of mankind or mankind's shortcomings because of sin. And it's not that the psalmist 
forgets to mention that you you only have to read all of the like many of the psalms surrounding Psalm 8 to, to read much about sin and death. But the psalmist is doing something here in Psalm 8. He's presenting a, this positive view and he's doing it to represent, to present to us the purpose of God for mankind. Mankind as God intended him to be in relationship with God, crowned with, with glory and honor. And so this positive view of mankind is really where we see that Christ is the fulfillment of the hopes expressed in Psalm 8. The Psalms are, we, we must remember that the Psalms are not, are not just our songbook, but in fact they were Jesus's songbook. And so Jesus was the one who, who expressed these Psalms and who sung these Psalms. And we, we know this because the author to the Hebrews tells us that this Psalm is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, the author to the Hebrews quotes the, the section we just read, Psalm 8, 4 through 6, in reference to the work of Jesus in his humanity. Jesus was the one who was for a little, a little while made lower than the angels. And in his humanity, he was crowned with, with glory and honor and everything was put under his feet. And the author to the Hebrews continues in, in, in Hebrews 8, right after quoting this psalm, and he says that, that God has put everything in subjection to him, that is Christ, and nothing is outside of his control. And that's really a, a, a great word of comfort for us, especially during this time, to be reminded of the fact that everything is, has been put in subjection to Christ and nothing not one thing is outside of his control. But he says something else here. The author to the Hebrews says something else here. He says, at, the pre at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You see, at the present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Um, he, in, he is reigning. Indeed, he is reigning over all things. But at present, we, we do not see it. And that's really the difficult thing about living in what's called the already and not yet. One day, of course, our faith will be sight. And we will see it. We will see uh, Christ reigning over all things and we will reign with him forever. But we don't see it now, is what the author to the Hebrews says. Rather, right now, as we live in this sin-filled world, this curse-filled world, this world fulfilled with disease and suffering, right now, we see Jesus in his suffering and we see Jesus in his death. We see him who was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death that he might bring many sons to glory. So knowing that, we can, we can take heart knowing that God came in the flesh. He loved us so much that he sent his son to come in the flesh to redeem us from our sin and curse-filled world. And we can hope, even in our present circumstances, even during this time, that's a very isolating time. We can find comfort and hope in our circumstances because of Christ, the true and righteous Son of Man. The true and righteous Son of Man who fulfills for us God's purpose for mankind expressed to us here in Psalm 8. So when you look up at the stars, when you gaze upon the heavens as the, the psalmist does here in, in Psalm 8, remember that everything is in subjection to Christ. And because of his suffering unto death, you and I have an everlasting hope that endures beyond our circumstances as we look forward to the glory, the hope of glory that we have in him. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.